God, you give us abundant reason to rejoice um, as we anticipate even a, a time when your glory will fill the entire earth as the water do the sea, does the seas. Um, God, uh, we, we anticipate that time. We look forward uh, to seeing Christ reign on his throne and the fulfillment of all your promises as you've promised them. As we stake our hope on unfulfilled words, as we have even staked our entire eternity on those promises, on your character, on your faithfulness, that you will in fact be God, a trustworthy God. Even as we turn our attention now to Obadiah, I pray that you would give us a clear view of this book, that all of the glorious implications that come from this teaching, that we would be eager to apply them to our own lives, that we would be eager to be transformed by what your word says so that you might receive all the glory from us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Pride has been rightly called a conveniently overlooked abomination. A conveniently overlooked abomination. And it is. Pride is a conveniently overlooked abomination. Uh, From God's perspective, it is abominable. Just note what Proverbs 16.5 says about this sin of pride. Everyone who is proud in heart, Proverbs 16.5 reads, is an abomination to Yahweh, to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished. Again, everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to Yahweh. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished. This is God's perspective on this sin that is all too often encouraged in people to trust your heart, speak your mind, do whatever you have to do to get ahead. Those various manifestations of pride. God says to him, the one who acts proudly, who embraces pride in his heart, is an abomination, hated by him, detestable to him. Now, as we continue in our 66 book study tonight, we will turn our attention to the book of Obadiah, the shortest book in your Old Testament. And there is perhaps no book in the Bible that better illustrates the truth of Proverbs 16.5 that everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to God. And it is certain, you can take this to the bank, that the one who is proud in heart will in fact be punished. Obadiah captures the truth of that verse, illustrates it very well for us. But in order to really get the weight of what Obadiah's message is, it would be good for us to just start at the beginning of Obadiah's historical context, uh, the historical background for that book. And if you've heard me numerous times, as I've tried to keep saying with every subsequent book that I've gotten to teach in this study, all roads in your Bible, eventually lead back to where? Torah. Yes, it's catching on. I love that. All roads lead back to Torah. Wherever you are in your Bible, once you get out of the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, every other author, every other writer of the scriptures relies on, alludes to, builds off of what Moses wrote. So the better you know your Pentateuch, the Torah, the law, the first five books of your Bible, 
then the better equipped you are to interpret the rest of the scriptures. And the same thing holds true of Obadiah. So let's just start our study tonight in Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25, we are introduced to the patriarch of Edom, this nation of Uh, by the name of Edom, the Edomites, or the sons of Esau. Here we're given the generations of Isaac in verse 19 of Genesis 25. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac. He married Rebekah when he was 40. And then if we just jump down just a little bit, they pray for children. And in verse 22, the children struggled together within Rebekah. And she said, if it is so, why am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And Yahweh said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So the destiny of these twins was predicted in the womb. Notice in verse 25, the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was appropriately called Jacob, one who grasps at the heel. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. So these twins, Esau and Jacob, are descendants of Abraham, sons of Abraham's son Isaac. And this is where Edom begins, and that's all pertinent for Obadiah. We see in Genesis 25 that there was conflict between these two twins, these peoples uh, from which these nations would come. There was conflict in the womb. Before they were even born, they were in conflict. One's grasping at the other one's heel. They're vying for position. One got out first the other one's hanging on. If you just look down, we won't read the story, but in verses 27 to 34, Moses quickly moves from their birth to their life, and we find something similar happening. Again, there is conflict. Now, there is conflict between the two twins over a meal, a bowl of red soup, And Jacob, being the deceiver and always trying to get ahead kind of person that he was, convinces his brother Esau to give him his birthright for a single meal. And that's what happens at the end of this story, verse 34. So Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This was a shame on Esau, actually gave up what he was due by his virtue of being the firstborn, his birthright, in exchange for a single meal. And this is pertinent to the two characters being described as the narrative develops because it's demonstrating that Esau cared nothing for spiritual realities. He cared nothing for uh, legacy and the honor of his parents, the honor due him by virtue of being the firstborn. He threw all of that away to satisfy his belly. What he should have told Jacob was, I would rather die than give you my birthright. But he didn't care. And so really this starts to portray Esau as the kind of man who is known for his absence of any honor or spirituality, 
And he's a man who's willing to serve his temporary fleshly appetites. That's the kind of man that he is. If you just fast forward again, not only is there conflict in the womb, conflict in life, but in chapter 27, we see that these two are even in conflict in death. Not their death, but Isaac's death. When he is nearing the end of his life and he doesn't know that he's going to live another 25 years or so, but when he is becoming frail, he recognizes that in faith he must pass on the blessing. The blessing that he received from Abraham uh, that God was had communicated to Abraham, all of those Abrahamic covenant blessings would be passed on to specific seed descendants. So Abraham got the blessings, passed on to Isaac. Now Isaac's going to entrust them by faith and pronounce these prophetic blessings over one of his sons, not both of them. And so if you just look forward to chapter 27, verse 27, we see that Jacob, with his mother's help, has deceived Isaac, convincingly made himself appear to his blind father as if he is his hairy brother. He comes near, he kisses his father, he smelled the smell of his garments, And he's convinced that it's Esau when it's not. It's Jacob. But he does bless him in faith. And he says, verse 27, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which Yahweh has blessed. Now may God give you the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May peoples serve you and nations bow down to you, be master of your brothers, your kinsmen, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you, as Abraham was told, and blessed be those who bless you. So the the blessing has been faithfully passed on to the one to whom it did not belong. When he finishes blessing Jacob, He's barely finished when Esau rushes in, done hunting, has prepared the meal, and he wants his blessing, not realizing that it's been already passed on. He hates Jacob, if you're familiar with the story, because of this deception. And just notice in verse 37 what Isaac says. He told Esau, behold, I have made him, that's your brother, your master. And all his fellow brothers I have given to him as as servants. And with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Notice these are all part of the covenant blessings when they will be fulfilled. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? And Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. So Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall be your habitation, and away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall be when he, when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. So just notice that he does not get the blessing, but he's not left completely devoid of hope either. He's told that he would eventually break that yoke from his, his neck, his brother's yoke. But he, verse 41, bears a grudge against Jacob because he didn't get the blessing. And he determines to kill Jacob once his father's dead. Again, thinking it would be sooner than it was, that day doesn't seem to come for probably about another 25 years. But 
important to note, there's conflict, 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 constantly between these two brothers. In the womb, at birth, in life, at death, seems that at every point to be had in the various human circumstances, there's conflict. There is a a time when peace eventually comes. Fast forward to chapter 33. When Jacob finally reunites after some 14 plus years of laboring for Laban, he finally reunites with Esau thinking that the grudge still remains. He finds out that it actually doesn't because God has seen fit to, to bless Esau anyway. Verse 4, then Esau ran to him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Sometimes family conflicts can be long-standing and yet God can bring about reconciliation, even unexpected reconciliation. And that's what happens here with Jacob and Esau. And so the bitterness has passed. Esau loves his brother, Jacob loves Esau. There's peace. Uh, The location of the land where Esau is dwelling by this time is identified. This is prior to Isaac's death, which doesn't come for another couple chapters. Uh, In chapter or verse 9, Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Let what you have be your own. And then in verse 16, he has plenty, but where? Verse 16 says he returned that day on his way to Seir. Seir. And this is where he has found a a habitation, a residing place in Seir. And just like Isaac prophesied, it is away from the fatness of the earth, as we'll see in Obadiah. This is up in the cliffs a mountainous, rugged, dry region. Chapter 36 gives the genealogy of Esau. Just one thing to to mention here. Uh, He's taking wives from Canaan. They prove to be a problem for Isaac because they are unbelieving women. Uh, Just like Esau, an unbelieving man. But in verse 31, Moses, even this early in the Torah, says this. This is Genesis 36, 31. Now, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king of the sons of Israel reigned. Interesting. He notes that Esau and Edom had kings before Israel had any kings. Uh, Just for reference sake, and we won't look at these, you can write down Genesis 17 and Deuteronomy 17. Genesis 17, Abraham is told by God, kings will come from you. So Moses had a good reason to anticipate a king reigning over Israel at some point. As various nations came from Abraham, uh, the nation of Israel being one of them, those nations that came from Abraham would have kings, Israel included. But at this point, even when Moses is writing in the wilderness, they don't have kings. But he anticipates a king. And even in Deuteronomy 17, he says, hey, one day you're going to ask for a king. And when you do, here's what the law is regarding that king. Here's the standards, the statutes for anyone you appoint king in your sin. And so they're anticipating kings, but at least here, The reason, I think, one reason he notes that Esau had kings is just to note that they were not governed by God. Israel was governed by God. They didn't need a king. And long before they sinfully would ask for a king, Edom appointed their own kings. They were not governed by God. They did not have God's law like Israel had the privilege of of having. You can also just note Psalm 52, another place where God's anointed one, David, wrote about 
being betrayed by an Edomite. The Edomites just keep coming up as in conflict with Israel. And Doeg takes the side of one wicked king of Israel, Saul, and betrays David. Turns David over to Saul to try and get him uh, caught and killed by Saul since Saul is looking for him. And I just want to read one, a few lines from Psalm 52 where David records that. For the choir director, Psalm 52, a mascal of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said to him, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. And just note the sins that Doeg committed in doing this. Verse 1. Why do you boast, David writes, in evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all day long. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right, Selah. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. The sins that Doeg, this Edomite, was characterized by in this moment include deceit, uh, verse 4, falsehood, verse 3, words that devour, verse 4, loving evil more than good, verse 3, and most notably, verse 1, boasting, a proud, arrogant boasting in evil. This Edomite, Doeg, was like his people. The Edomites have been in perpetual conflict with Israel from the beginning. The the same is true in Obadiah's day, and they're characterized by the same sins. Flip over to Obadiah. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. One chapter, shortest book in your Old Testament, but a phenomenal prophet that is very instructive for the church. It was instructive for Israel when it was written. It's instructive for the church today, as we'll see. These people are characterized and have been characterized by the same sins. Follow along as I read Obadiah. The vision of Obadiah... Thus says Lord Yahweh concerning Edom. We have heard a report from Yahweh, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us arise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, You who dwell in the clefts of the cliff in the height of your habitation, who says in his heart, who will bring me down to earth? Though you build loftily like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares Yahweh. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you have been ruined. Would they not thieve only until they had enough? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not allow some gleanings to remain? Oh, how Esau will be searched out and his hidden treasures ransacked. All the men who have a covenant with you will send you forth to the border, and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They will eat your bread, will, they who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no discernment in him. Will I not on that day, declares Yahweh, cause the, men, the wise men to perish from Edom and discernment from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Timon, so that each one may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter because of violence to your brother Jacob. You will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On the day when you stood aloof, on the day that strangers took his wealth captive, 
and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Now, do not look on your brother's day with triumph, the day of his misfortune. And do not be glad over the sons of Judah in the day when they perish. And do not let your mouth be great things in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Indeed, you do not look on their calamity with triumph in the day of their disaster. And do not send out for their wealth in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down those among them who escape. And do not deliver over their saviors in the day of their distress. Why? Verse 15. For the day of Yahweh draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Because just as you all drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow, and they will be as if they never were. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape, and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be a stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them, so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for Yahweh has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, and those of the Shephelah, the Philistine plain, and they will possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead, and the exiles of this military force of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the cities of the Negev, and the saviors will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will belong to Yahweh. This is a phenomenal prophecy. I have tried to just capture what's happening in this short book in three divisions. Three divisions. Here's what they are. I'll give them all up to you up front and then work through them briefly. They are God's merciless pronouncement in verses 11 or 1 through 11. God's merciless pronouncement is what comes first. I don't have an outline for you tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you'll have to just listen closely. God's merciless pronouncement is first. And then you have in the very middle of the book, verses 12 to 14, is God's merciful prescription. God's merciful prescription. And then finally, God's manifold purpose, verses 15 through 21. God's merciless pronouncement, God's merciful prescription, and God's manifold purpose. Maybe you recognize this just as I was reading through. In the first 11 verses, all you have are tremendous destruction being predicted. That's all it is. It's merciless. No mercy for Esau, only destruction. They are going to be humbled. There is war. There is diminishment. There is ruin coming. That involves deception, bewilderment, and this is all God's justice at work against Esau. No mercy for Esau, only destruction and humbling for him because of his pride. But if you notice, from that pronouncement, there's actual instruction given in verses 12 to 14. Commands. It shifts from just predictions about the future, what's coming to Esau, to instruction. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't treat Israel this way because of something else that's coming. And that's an important distinction in the letter in the prophecy, and I think it says something about the timing, which we'll discuss in a second, 
for this letter. But then it finally ends with something beyond future to God's judgment on Esau and what's coming for Israel. And it ends beautifully, the very last words of the prophecy, and the kingdom will belong to Yahweh. End scene. <laughs> That's the end. So what's happening in, in this prophecy is that, and this has to do with the, the timing, which is actually very difficult to place, But some misfortune came to Israel and Edom, the Edomites, were participants in that military attack. They don't seem to be leading the way, leading the attack. They weren't the primary aggressors, but they joined in whatever that military attack was on on Israel. You, You notice this in verse 10 where Obadiah writes, because of violence done to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, you didn't help. On the day that strangers took his wealth captive and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. So they're condemned for their participation in this attack. We're not sure what that attack was. Um, It doesn't have a really clear, precise historical event that it can be tied to. Commentators are divided on what that event might be. But I do think that the better evidence is that this was not the Babylonian invasion that happened in Nebuchadnezzar's reign when Jerusalem was finally overtaken. And the reason I think that that's not a good event to tie this to is because of the very next verses that come. Verse 12 says, with instruction, do not look on your brother's day with triumph, the day of his misfortune. Do not be glad over the sons of Judah in the day when they perish. And do not let your mouth speak great things in the day of their distress. And then you get three times in the day of their distress, verse 12, and then verse 13, in the day of their disaster, in the day of their disaster, in the the day of their disaster, and then finally in verse 14, in the day of their distress. It's anticipating a coming day, their disaster, their distress, and so the best event that captures a description of that coming day is the Babylonian invasion. So some event, some military attack prior to the Babylonian invasion when Jerusalem was ultimately decimated, destroyed, the temple was burned. That's coming, but prior to that, they were attacked. People cast lots for Jerusalem, and Edom participated. Some people were taken captive. Edom stood aloof, and helped. And so God is furious with Edom, identifies Jacob as their brother, as Edom's brother, due to the history. Esau and Jacob were brothers, and they wrongly took the side of Israel's adversaries. And so as regarded, regards the date, there's not a really precise dating, but being prior to the Babylonian invasion and because the language of Obadiah is quoted in Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, that would actually put Obadiah before even those prophets, making Isaiah, or excuse me, Obadiah, making Obadiah the earliest writing prophet. And so Obadiah and some themes that get captured here, Jerusalem's destruction's coming, verses 12 to 14, but the day of the Lord, verse 15, is, is, call, is uh, described, and that phrase is first used here. So the other prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, 
all pick up on the day of the Lord language. Zephaniah, as we've studied, picks up on the day of the Lord language. And they all are expansions of what's found in seed form in Obadiah. So Obadiah is first. Here's what all of this means as we just quickly move through the, the quick book, the brief book. God, in the first 11 verses, has a merciless pronouncement against Esau, and this includes war. Look at verse 1. An envoy has been sent among the nations. That's, again, nations, plural. Arise and let us, multiple nations, us, arise against her, Edom, for battle. And this is all God at work. Behold, I, the Lord says, will make you, Edom, small among the nations. You are greatly despised. So it anticipates war against Edom and multiple nations will participate in this military endeavor. And what will God be doing in that? Well, he will be making Edom small. He will be making Edom small, uh, no nation, microscopic. And history records that this happened until Edom couldn't even be recognized as a nation and by the time uh, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, Edom was no longer a nation, had been so scattered, so reduced among the nations that they weren't one. This merciless pronouncement would not only include war, but diminishment. Uh, that's what we read in verse 1. Uh, I will make you small, excuse me, verse 2, behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. It would include war, diminishment, and humbling. Verse 3, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the cliff, in the height of your habitation, who says in his heart, who will bring me down to earth? <laughs> Yikes. It's not what you want to be saying in your heart where God can see. That kind of pride would entreat God to humble you. And so this is what he says he would do. Verse 4, from there I will bring you down, declares Yahweh. So proud, arrogant Edom will be humbled. This merciless pronouncement includes the ruin of Edom. That's what's described in Verses 5 and following, uh, if thieves came to you, if robbers by night, they don't take everything. If people gleaned and gathered your grapes, they wouldn't take absolutely every grape. But Edom's destruction wouldn't be like this. The destruction that God would bring on Edom, he says, would include verse 6 being searched out, hidden, even the hidden treasures would be ransacked. So it's ca capturing a comprehensive, oh, how you will be ruined, verse 5. A comprehensive, sudden, intrusive ruining of Edom. It would involve not only these things, but deception from the other nations who would ransack Edom. Verse 7, all the men who have covenant have a covenant with you, uh, all the men at peace with you, he says, they will deceive you and overpower you. Just like you did, Jacob, they'll do to you. They'll set an ambush to the point that it will cause bewilderment. No more discernment in Edom, verse 7. In that day, the wise men would perish as well as, verse 9, the mighty men will be dismayed. So there won't, nobody's going to have answers for the kind of destruction that comes on Edom when it comes. No, no wise men, none of the sages of the nation, nor the mighty men, the warriors, no one's going to have answers for what to do when God brings destruction on Edom. Just notice, this justice, as we've already noted, comes because of their violence, verses 10 and 11. Because of their violence, because of their solidarity, all against 
God's people, Jacob, Jerusalem. So this is just of God to bring this about on Edom, to cut them off forever because of their sin against God's people. This then leads, this merciless pronouncement turns then, though, to a merciful prescription. Hey, Edom, you've done this. Destruction's coming, but here's some instruction for you. If you want to be wise, then do this. Don't look on your brother's day with triumph when it comes. The day of their misfortune, don't look on on it with triumph. Don't be glad over them on the day when they will perish. Don't let your mouth speak great things or literally enlarge your mouth, right, to boast over them in the day of their distress. So when this time comes, the next time, the ultimate destruction that's coming, it's coming, but don't act like this on that day when it comes. That's what you did last time. Don't let it happen again. So that's just what, what mercy of God to tell this rebellious people that he has now set his heart to destroy to now provide instruction for them and say, don't do this. Don't act this way. That is, when God warns, that's instructive and that's mercy. So this is a merciful prescription. This, this anticipates not only Israel's misfortune, but it directs Edom's way. This is directive and instructive for Edom, how to act in the future. And who knows, maybe, just maybe, God would relent from the disaster that he's determined to bring about. If we humble ourselves before the Lord, just maybe the God who is rich in mercy will be merciful to Edom the next time Israel's destruction comes. What's Israel thinking at this point? Yeah, go get them, God. They mistreated us. Destruction's coming. Oh, wait. Destruction's coming for us too? How come you're telling them what to do when our destruction comes? Right? If you're believing Obadiah the prophet, then you're, you're realizing we're not getting a pass on our rebellion, Israel. Judah, just because we're God's people, just because we live in Jerusalem in God's place doesn't give us a pass on our idolatry. Destruction's coming to us too. And so with all of that in mind, Edom's destruction as an unbelieving nation is coming. Judah's destruction as a rebellious, should-be believing nation is also coming. Verse 15, the day of Yahweh draws near on whom? How many nations? All nations. All nations. It's it's just baffling to think of Israel in the New Testament. Even when you open your first pages of the New Testament, what do we find? Foolish Israel boasting in being sons of Abraham. How stupid. The sons of Abraham get judgment when they don't obey, when they don't keep their side of the covenant. They knew this. They should have known this. They were told this, and yet they refused to believe God. We're going to believe the parts about God's revelation that the unbelieving nations are going to be humbled and destroyed and hang our hat on that and just conveniently overlook the words that talk about God's judgment and retribution against his own people. To believe some parts of your Bible and not all of it is unbelief. To believe only some parts is to believe none at all. That's what Israel was practicing. Just notice all of the commands in verses 12, 13, 14 that come to Edom, they're told how to act toward God's people, and then the first word of verse 15, they're told why to do these things. Because, for, 
the day of the Lord comes on all nations. We've seen this before. If you were here for our study of Zephaniah, the same thing happens in Zephaniah. You get three verses in the beginning of chapter 2 that culminate in a seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden on that day. For the day of the Lord comes. And then you get a because... Here's the destruction that's coming on this nation. Here's the destruction coming on this nation. Here's the destruction coming on this nation. And that's the same kind of situation we have in verse 15. Obey the Lord, humble yourselves, and cease to act proudly, Edom. Verse 15, because the day of the Lord's coming, it, it even draws near on all nations, that no nation will escape the day of the Lord when it comes. Not even you, Edom, so humble yourselves. Even that has an air of hope to it. And that's really the, the third section of this prophecy, God's manifold purpose, God's manifold purpose. And that's just weaved throughout the, the rest of these, these verses, God's manifold purpose. Here's what I mean by manifold. It's not just one thing that God's doing when the day of the Lord comes. It's not just singular. He doesn't just have one thing in mind that he's going after when the day of the Lord comes. That's what this shows us. His purpose is manifold. It's, it varies. It includes more than just a singular purpose, as we'll see. And here are the two purposes if you just want to uh, capture them in, in two purposes that God has. One is worldwide retribution. Worldwide retribution. That's one aspect of God's purpose. The day of the Lord draws near on all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head because just as you all drank on my holy mountain, all the nations, again, all the nations, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow. They're going to be made to take it all the way down. And they will be as if they never were. Yikes. Extermination is what he has, except, verse 17, there will be those who escape. Wow. Where? Mount Zion. Again, sounds like Zephaniah who comes later. Perhaps you will escape. Perhaps you will be hidden, rescued. There will be those who escape. And that mountain will be called holy. But worldwide retribution is in view. And in addition, the, the, another purpose, which makes it manifold, not singular, that God has in view is not only worldwide, ret worldwide retribution, but also covenant fulfillment. Covenant fulfillment. That's how the letter ends, the, the prophecy ends. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape and it will be called holy and the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. He will possess the gate of his enemies is what Abraham was told when he didn't sacrifice Isaac. That seed that's coming will possess the gate of his enemies. This is the fulfillment of that promise made long ago. When the house of Jacob, the descendants of Jacob, Jacob's seed will possess their possessions, the nation's possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. You know, what was almost reduced to nothing, the ones who escaped would now fan out into an all-consuming fire while the house of Esau is left to be stubble, verse 18, and they will set them on fire and consume them so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for Yahweh has spoken. God sets his own reputation, and his faithfulness to his word, to this promise. Jacob will get what was promised to him. 
the ultimate final destruction that will come, that was predicted for Esau will come. And then verse 19, then what? When that day arrives, when these events finally unfold, then, that's a time marker, then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau and those of the Shephelah, the Philistine plain, and they will possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead and the exiles of this military force of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in the Sepharad will possess the cities of the Negev and the saviors will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau. You have about nine different places mentioned here. Nine different places, including regions within Israel and surrounding Israel. These are various locations in the land of Canaan that was promised to Abraham long ago. What's happening? This is descriptive of the fulfillment of the covenant that was made to Abraham. Fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant is coming. And Obadiah is just capturing all of that in a hurry, bundling all of that up in brief to say the promises have not failed. They're still outstanding. God will not fail. He will fulfill his promises. The covenant is still on. And today, fast forward, the covenant still on. <laughs> it still is outstanding. Israel has not gotten its possession. This has not come true, so we're still waiting. So wait. Wait on the Lord. Some things, some ways that this is instructive for us. I've got about 12 points of application we don't have time to spend time on them all. Understand the day of the Lord. Understand the day of the Lord. Scripture's not unclear. It's coming. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. God's got manifold purposes in mind. He, he is going to humble the nations, destroy the nations, and rescue his people. Be those who will be rescued. Be among those who will be rescued. How? Trust God. Take him at his word. Believe in his king who is coming. The same king who died for sins, he is coming to reign, and he will destroy the earth, rid the earth of his enemies when he comes to reign. You can be under his boot or in his, in his good graces because you have entrusted your soul to him in faith. Be that. Be a part of the latter group. Entrust yourself to Christ. Be rescued from the day of the Lord. Not only understand the day of the Lord and what God intends in it, but know God. There's so much theology proper to glean from Obadiah. Let me just give you uh, some things to know about God from this prophecy. God is a God of retribution. You can't downplay that. You can't skip that unless you just want to... Um, you know, take a, an exacto knife to Obadiah in your Bible and remove it. Otherwise, it stands, God is a God of vengeance. God is also a God of knowledge. He's the kind of God who can tell a nation of rebels what they say in their heart, where no one else can see. And so he's also a God who can tell us, each one of us, the thoughts that we have in our heart. Don't take solace in the fact that the people you're accountable to in your small group don't know what you're doing in your heart because you can't hide from God. So be upright in heart. Change at the heart level. Sanctify yourself at the heart level with God's truth. Believe it there. That's where it counts. God is a God of knowledge. He is omniscient and sees all. Note from this prophecy that God will defend his people and he will defend his place. He will defend his people. He will defend his place. To think about his people for a second, that means Israel specifically. 
Obadiah believed that Israel was God's people. Jesus said Israel was God's people. The apostles said Israel was God's people. And all of those prophecies still stand to Israel. God will defend his people. And the church, Gentiles who have been brought into the same covenant promises, Romans 9 through Romans 11, those promises still stand. We're still banking on the same promises, believing the same God. And so we get the benefits of the same blessings when they finally come. The same kingdom that's been, that's been promised to Israel, Gentiles will be there. The Old Testament Gentiles were promised to enter into the kingdom. And so New Testament Gentiles, the same promises still stand. God will defend his people. That includes all those Jews and Gentiles who trust him. And he'll defend his place, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that only city on the map, prime, most valuable real estate on the planet. God's going to show up. He's going to defend his own glory in Jerusalem. And as Obadiah says, it will be called finally, rightly, holy. God sovereignly commands the nations. He gave, you can write down Deuteronomy 2, verses 1 through 8, where God says that he gave Esau possession of Mount Seir. So even unbelieving nations, God gives them the places that they inhabit. But commensurate with that fact, those blessings are only temporary for the wicked. They are only temporary. Think about Esau being given his land first before Jacob. He had his land, he had his inheritance first, but shortest. Israel will have his land last and longest. So what is, what's the implication for, for believers? Don't envy the wicked. They have their best life now. And that's it. The eternal blessing is better, even though it's coming later. Be content to wait on the Lord. Don't envy sinners. Study the fate of the wicked is an implication. Notice to whom the prophecy is addressed in verse 1. Thus says the Lord concerning Edom. So it's about Edom. But who are the words given to? Israel. The book's a part of Israel's canon. You're not going to find Obadiah in any sacred writing of any Edomites. <laughs> right? It was never a part of their religious tradition. God, this is, if, if I had to give another title to the, the book of Obadiah, this is Obadiah's open letter to Edom. <laughs> Here, Israel, here's what God says about your enemies. That's instructive for us because God's people receive the benefit of the instruction about the fate of the wicked. So we should study the fate of the wicked. We can glean from it. We can be spurred on to greater fidelity to God when we meditate rightly on the disaster and the day of the Lord that's coming for the wicked. It's instructive for us. An obvious implication um, that I've kind of hit on already, take God at his word literally. Just read <laughs> your Bible and believe what it says literally. You don't need to spiritualize or allegorize or do anything funny with the words. They just stand and they're fine on their own. Humbly receive them. Finally, the, the obvious instruction for us is to mortify pride to mortify pride, to think about what God says in this letter to a proud people. Don't be proud. Don't be proud. And don't think that you can be humble on accident. If you're not trying to be humble, 
then you're not being humble. It just not it's not natural to us. What does he what does he tell Edom verse three? The arrogance of your heart, pride is a heart issue. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. Pride is deceptive. As soon as you have a proud thought, you have deceived yourself. It'll cause you to deceive yourself, to deceive others, to convince yourself, I am greater than I actually am. It believes the first deception, I am God. I can be like God. Great. No, you can't. No, we can't. We can't be like God. Great. Only God is great. And we are humans. We are man. Not great, insignificant, nothing special, but people beloved by God who can be used for great purposes to God's great ends. And so we should attempt to be used by God for his own great ends while humbly submitting to his great purposes. Let me pray. God, thank you for this wonderful prophecy that you would move holy men to write your words, uh, not of their own interpretation, as we were reminded by Zach this morning, but these words were given by the, the movement of your Holy Spirit to carry along men to tell us exactly what we needed to know for life and godliness. And so we thank you for speaking to us. Help us to exalt, not ourselves, but your words, your truth, just as you have exalted your own word according to your own reputation, your own name. God, if you would use us to this end, we would be so grateful And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.